<laughs> Hello, everyone. So this this might be a little disjointed. It's um it's kind of not like my usual talks because there's so much information in in this one topic, and it's it feels like I'm I'm very close to something really profound, and it's on the tip of my tongue, and I'm not quite getting it yet. So maybe you know one of you is is actually going to get it for me. So. <laughs> So, again, unlike some, some of my uh, other talks, there are no solutions as such um, to the problems that will come up, but we'll see how we do. Right, so the language of creation. First of all, sound is not sound. We've got this uh, idea, uh, you've all heard of this idea, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Well, actually it doesn't. Um, what happens when a tree falls in the forest, literally air molecules get compressed and literally it's just a wave of air molecules. It takes an ear with an eardrum and a nervous system and a brain in order to make sound. We make sound, not the, the outside world. There's no such thing as sound in the outside world. It happens in here. Sound, the idea we're, I'm talking about today, is a precise manipulation of energy and matter with vibration and frequency, sort of sound in a nutshell. So what sound can do is organise matter. It can animate matter and levitate it even. It also creates energy and it can manipulate energy. So I'm going to watch a couple of videos here to see exactly what sound can do. Is everyone familiar with cymatics? Anyone? Hands up, anyone? Yeah, okay, a few people. As the frequency increases, the uh, complexity of the patterns that are generated can, can increases. And literally all it is is a loudspeaker underneath a piece of dark card and uh, there's some sort of flower medium on top. All done with just sound. And bear in mind, it's just one frequency being put into that, uh, that loudspeaker. If you put multiple frequencies, you know, even even more complex um, features. I think in a little while we're going to move on to uh, levitation. I find it interesting that it's asym asymmetrical as well. You know, you kind of expect sound to, to make a kind of symmetrical pattern. But it's, it's very strange that it comes out sometimes as uh, asymmetrical. You see the mo movement there as well, the animation. It's almost difficult to believe that this can be naturally formed, so artificial.
Has anyone seen this before? Yeah. So literally he's got two sound transducers and just, just hovering these uh, bits of polystyrene at this point. They've improved this now, they can actually make, you know, these small items actually just move around in 3D space now, not just hover. But this is just accomplished with sound, sound waves. Okay, well, um, well, I think you get the idea there. Um, I'm going to move on to um, seeing how sound affects water. So we've just got a speaker there and uh, um, a rubber hose with water coming out of it, or will be coming out of it, and uh, a tone generator. Pretty weird. Yeah, later on it goes backwards. And literally it's just a 24 hertz sound wave going into that water. Whereabouts is the sound produced? Is it inside the... It's some, right above it there's a, um, a speaker, a loudspeaker at the top. I think they just they changed the frequency in a second. All right, 25 hertz now. And I think if they turn the frequency down, it goes backwards. goes back up. Very weird. But that's just, again, just sound affecting the water. Okay. Right, so now I'm going to go on to something called sonoluminescence. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but we'll have a look at that. It's a process called sonoluminescence. The first time I saw sonoluminescence was in a darkened room. I was transfixed to look at this uh, spherical flask of fluid. And you look into the center, and in the center see a, uh, a glowing blue-purple light, uh, which could be seen with the unaided eye. like a star in the heavens. It does look like a star, doesn't it? Seth Putterman called it the star in a jar, a tiny spot of bright light contained in a flask of liquid. This star in a jar 
is made when a sound wave is passed through a small bubble inside a flask of liquid. And this sound wave makes the bubble do something remarkable. First it expands, then it collapses. And this collapse happens so violently that vapor molecules trapped inside the bubble slam together and heat up so much that the bubble gives off an incredible burst of heat and light several thousand times a second, giving the appearance of a star. What made the phenomenon so exciting was the temperature of this star in a jar. On its surface alone, the light burns at tens of thousands of degrees. Tens of thousands of degrees just from passing sound waves into liquid. Okay. Now, it, it kind of looked like a star, didn't it? Twinkling like it did. It's funny that um, when we uh, use a, a Nikon P900 camera to zoom in on the stars, it looks exactly like that. Yeah? The, the Old Testament says that uh, above the firmament is water. So you can imagine that the stars we see are created by sound. This is called a pyro board. Ready? Go. So what you're seeing here is a, is a kind of tank with dr holes drilled on, um, on the top and it's, been, um, it's got gas being pumped into it and uh, um, a speaker is actually manipulating that gas, the, uh, the, fi the fire, the flame. And you can see how it's, uh, it doesn't come out very well, but uh, you can see how the sound is literally um, manipulating the, the, the fire's energy. Okay, get the idea, yeah? Audience participation, yes Dave. <laughs> okay. So this guy's got a, um, a serious sound system in his car. Now this isn't what, that one, no. But you're going to see how that sound affects matter. Watch, watch the glass. What, and now look at the metal, the steel. Just <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? No, I'm telling you, if you've got the, the resonant frequency of the glass and the steel, literally the glass would shatter, the, the metal will start to fly apart if you've got the right resonant frequency of that car. And if he drives around in that car with that music blaring, eventually that car is just going to fall apart. <laughs> so that's incredible. So let's look at how sound affects us. Um, we can actually follow... Um, 1.6 conversations, so it's just a bit more than one and a half conversations. So you can be talking to somebody and you can be half listening to somebody else and you catch round about half of the other conversation. Interestingly, I had a, um, an experience with a medicinal plant and, um, and what I found, I was able to listen to and follow six different conversations in the room at once. The, the barrier that stopped me from doing that, which... Uh, you know, it's, I guess it's uh, necessary because you want to focus on a, one conversation. Um, that, that barrier drops and I could I literally understand everything that was going on in the room. It's an incredible. Um, pink noise, which is, a, which is a kind of shh sound, you can play it really loud and after about five minutes it will disappear. You won't hear it anymore. It, literally, your, your, your brain will just screen it out.
Okay. Um, now surf causes relaxation, the sound of surf. Now the sound of surf is pink noise. So literally the sound of surf fades into your background and your breathing tends to become aligned with the surf. So it relaxes you. Bird song actually calms us and makes us feel safe. Okay, there's lots of uh, animals and, um, and plants actually that respond to bird song. Music can be made to manipulate our, our um, states as well, or our, uh, our moods as well. Um, there was an experiment that was done in, uh, in an off license, and literally they would play French music, kind of really low level French music, so you can just barely hear it. And those days that they played French music, they sold more French wine. They played German music, they sold more German wine. Yeah, it's very, um, it's very powerful. Um, yeah, and music alters our emotional states and our physiology. Yeah, you can, you can hear some music and, you know, if you're driving, you drive faster. <laughs> yeah, your heart will beat faster, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll feel energized. You can hear other music and it will, it will literally slow you down and calm you down. In this uh, encounter with, with this, this plant, it basically told me about the nature of sound. It showed me that we have an internal music. Our muscles and uh, organs and everything work with sound and movement. So when I was having this experience, I could hear this music going on inside me. And when I, say, moved my hand, it was like the string section started. And there was a, a little musical riff that I started to recognize. So I'd move my hand and I'd hear this little riff go on. I'd move my foot and I'd hear this other riff. And it all sort of blended into this, this amazing orchestra. So I asked the plant, you know, what happens when we listen to external music? And it told me, that uh, external music overwhelms our internal music and entrains our internal music. And it showed me a heavy metal guy, you know, kind of lurching down the road. <laughs> and it was showing me that the, the music that um, certain people listen to make them all act and think and move in the same way. So all heavy metal, you know, listeners they all seem to have that kind of hunched over, that kind of uh, slouchy walk, yeah, because the music is in training them to be like that. So interestingly, um, some of you might have heard about this, that uh, the, all the music, all the music in the world has now been changed over, the frequencies of the music have been changed over from 432 hertz for middle A to 440 hertz. Now that doesn't sound like a, an awful lot of difference, but as you can see here, the, the pattern on 432 is a very nice harmonious kind of pattern there, and the one for 440 is dissonant. It's just a kind of mess. In 1939, there was military acoustic warfare research, and they were, they were investigating how sound, um, particularly music, would affect people. And they discovered that by shifting the frequencies over just a little bit, it would induce hysteria. 1939 was when they discovered it, but they started putting it into practice in the 60s. Elvis and the Beatles were biological weapon tests. Literally, the hysteria that went along with Elvis in America and the Beatles here was because they were they were testing this 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 shift in the in the, in the, in the frequencies. That's why there was that hysteria. We've got used to it now, so you know we're we're in kind of low levels of hysteria when we're listening to this music. But you know, um, you can actually go onto YouTube and do a search for, you know, 432 hertz versions of music you like, and you can find it most of the time. 
So the, the military have actually weaponized sound now. This is a, um, a device called LRAD, and uh, they're, they're using it for, for crowd control. Literally, it's, uh, it, it hurts you, it physically hurts you, uh, hurts your skin, and, and obviously hurts your ears as well. So, yeah, it's funny that everything they discover gets to be turned into a weapon. There's also um, the idea that music and is, is actually mathematical in nature. This is what's known as the perfect circle of sound. These frequencies are healing frequencies. Um, some of you might have heard of uh, 528 hertz. Anybody? Yeah. yeah? Um, there's a kind of mathematics called Pythagorean maths. Okay, So really all it is, it, it just doesn't have a zero. So when you start going up right, in the frequencies, um, you, you add, um, say, so you start off with uh, 174 there on, on, on the left. Okay? You add one to each of the numbers, and when you get to nine, you go back to one. So if you can see that you just keep adding one to all these numbers and flip back to, ni um, to, to one when you get to nine, literally it goes round in a circle. And uh, all of these frequencies are healing frequencies. So it's all very mathematical. Um, yes. But interesting, look, 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 369. So the 369s are linked. Tesla said that uh, if you wish to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. And he's saying the magnificence of 369. So again, we, we don't really know what he's, he, he stumbled across, but it sounds, sounds to me like it's about sound and music. They've been working with dissonant sound to cause physiological changes in us. Everything gets weaponized, as I said. So, interestingly enough, we have very, very sophisticated vibration and frequency generators, yeah, our voice. But, you know what, we tend to believe that uh, the reason we've got them is to make these small mouth noises um, in order to communicate. Maybe that's not the truth. This is an example of how our how voices look under the cymoscope. So our voices produce sacred geometry. Now you don't need to have uh, an amazing voice either. This guy's just um, making sounds into uh, a drum with uh, I think it's rice or, or salt on top. So it might seem silly, but he's literally changing the, the shape of matter with his voice. I think that's pretty incredible, that one. Yeah, just simply with your mouth. So I'm, I'm suggesting to you that uh, you know perhaps our voices aren't just here to make these small mouth noises. In fact, um, I don't know if anyone's seen stories like this. You know, we think um, that our voices are for language, and we you know language is fairly straightforward to understand. But there have been cases where people have um, you know had a stroke or got a blow on the head and woken up speaking an entirely different language. You know, if it was an isolated case, then yeah, you could, you could come up with some excuses for it. But you know what? It's not very isolated. Do a search and you'll find lots and lots and lots of cases of this, including one guy, an Australian guy, 
who woke up speaking fluent Chinese. And he was, he was so fluent that he, could, he, could, he went to, to China and started teaching in China. Um, and and he, w- he was a host on a game show in China. Yeah? Never spoke Chinese before in his life. So it means that language doesn't work the way we think it does. In the Old Testament, it tells you that uh, the Most High created the universe you know, with, with his voice. With sound, the Most High said, "Let there be light," and there was light. You know, He called the light day. You know, He said, "Let there be a firmament." Yeah, He created with sound, and there's a language of creation because the Most High, as I say, created the universe with words. Universe, one word, yeah, um, one speech. He spoke to Adam in that one language. And uh, that language was called Paleo-Hebrew. So Adam's first job was to name the animals. Now if you look at the word name in Paleo-Hebrew, it's the word sham. And it doesn't just mean label. It means to set, to make, to um, describe the character, the reputation. Yeah, so Adam was co-creating the animals. Yeah, he had a hand in creating the behaviour, the, you know, the, the character of each animal. So, you know, call a fly a fly. Why do you call a fly a fly? <laughs> so, um, in the book of Jubilees, it literally um, is very, very specific. He actually says that uh, he, when he was talking about Abraham, he spoke to Abraham in Hebrew, the language of creation, a tongue of creation. There's also a magic word, abracadabra. People might be surprised to know that uh, that's an actual word. It's, um, it's a Paleo-Hebrew word, and it means, I create that which I speak. So it's used as a kind of invocation. It's like uh, reinforcing the command, just like um, Captain Picard on, uh, on Star Trek Next Generation, one of my favourite shows, he would say, he would give a command like, uh, number one, set course to Earth, warp factor five, make it so. Okay, make it so is that underlying that reinforcement, that's what abracadabra is, it's that, you know, I, I create that which I speak. So the scientific community have actually caught up and figured out that uh, the oldest language in, you know, in the world is Hebrew. And they mean Paleo-Hebrew because, uh, and I'll get into that in a little while later. But yeah, the oldest alphabet has been identified and it's Hebrew. So this is Paleo-Hebrew. It reads right to left. So the letter, the equivalent of the letter A is up there in the top right. And uh, it's, it's a pictorial language. The pictures mean something to the ancient Hebrew. So the letter A there is a picture of the head of an ox. Now in the Hebrew world, the ox was the strongest animal um, they they knew about. Okay, so that head of the ox means strength, power, leadership first. Each one of these letters has about eight different meanings. And unlike any other language, you know, the languages we're used to, you don't go down the list and select the meaning you like. You take all of those meanings and, and see what that feels like to you. Okay? It's, it's very different to uh, all these other languages. And we'll get into how it works later on. So that language, I mean, you can see that um, um, the A is the head of an ox, the B is the floor plan of a tent, the um, the G, the G, is, um, I think it's uh, a foot, a camel, a um, camel's foot. The, the D is the fl- flap, door flap of the tent, because they used to live in tents, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, interestingly, the, the H sound is a picture of a man holding his arms up. Yeah? In the fake Hebrew, it's the letter, they called that letter Hay. 
and it means behold, it means look, it means, it means hey. <laughs> now we still use some of, these, some of these words in our language. The Phoenicians, who, were, who lived you know, in and amongst the, the, the Hebrews, um, they basically took that la same language and they standardised the, uh, the letters. So you can see the letter A is still the head of an ox, but uh, it's kind of just made more stylized. You, know, you still see the horns and the ears and stuff and the triangular face. Um, now, interestingly, the area which Paleo-Hebrew um, originated was the kind of the Middle East. Now, all the languages west of, uh, of the Middle East area is um, the, all the languages become not pictorial, but symbolic. So the letters don't mean anything anymore. They're just shapes. And um, they're abstract. Yeah? So, so literally, it's, it becomes a conceptual language and not a concrete one. As I said, the, the letter A was a concrete, something you can point to. Yeah, that's the head of an ox. It means something. Now you've got an A, which is just a shape. Every language to the east actually is still pictorial and still concrete. Not so much today because now we're the, these uh, other languages like Chinese, Japanese, um, Sanskrit, uh, Arabian, they're now symbolic. Now people don't look at the, uh, the actual meanings anymore, they're just, they're just shapes. Now, uh, I, I didn't mention that uh, all the languages to the west read left to right. All the languages to the east read right to left. So it's basically pointing to where it originated from. Now, bearing in mind that um, Egypt, on everything sort of on the line of Egypt, which is again the Middle East, um, is considered the centre of the landmass of the earth. Okay? And that was always known as, um, as the centre of the earth because the, the Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean, Middle Earth, that's what it means. Okay? So all the languages started off as um, Paleo-Hebrew and they scattered from that point. And what was the event that uh, caused the scattering? Well, it says so in the Old Testament, the Tower of Babel. It says, behold, the people is one and they all have one language, Paleo-Hebrew. And the languages were confounded and literally everybody went from that point with, with separate languages. Now, you can actually see the uh, progression from the original Paleo-Hebrew, which is the, the, ver the pictograms, to the stylized version from the Phoenicians, then to the, the, the Greek. Now, you can see how the letter A there, you can see how it went from um, the head of an ox to slightly on its side, and then turned upside down for Greek, and then stylized a bit more until it got to the letter A that we know now. Okay? And you can, you can trace how all the, the letters um, sort of you know, came, came about. Now, it's interesting, the letter V, there is no V in Paleo-Hebrew. Okay? There's this, there's this um, character called, uh, you pronounce it, Uau. Okay? Uau. Um, so you'll find that um, you know, U, V and W, because there are no vowels in Paleo-Hebrew, just uh, an ah uh sound. So um, U, V and W, there's no U sound. So literally this is, when you've got the word wow, it actually starts with the U sound. Yeah? So that's where, um, uh, I think, I'll step back a second. There was a um, point where I discovered the letter W. Um, you're going to see later on with uh, reverse speech. Um, Obama said something, and uh, we're going to see it, but he said something forwards, and when he, it got reversed, there was a U sound that wasn't there in forwards. I was thinking, how, how did he get the U sound? And <laughs> it turned out the... the it, forwards, it was a w, it was a w sound, and I was thinking, well, how did he get the the u sound um, from a w? But if you think about it, 
You can't say w without u first. Wa, you know, wa is starts with a u. Now in in French, when they say we, it's o u i, oui. We just concentrate on the w bit. We forget about the u. So I was thinking, where, how, how does that happen? How do you get the u? And I just realised double u. <laughs> That's that word is a double U. I was like, oh, I discovered a double U. <laughs> anyway, um, so that was the evolution to, to, to English from Paleo Hebrew. Um, so, what is English? English is actually Anglish. Okay, and if you follow the, the entomology of uh, Anglo and Anglo Saxons and stuff, you'll find it means angel, angelish. And it's not the good angels, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's the, it's English, Anglish is angelish, which is the language of the fallen angels. It's, again, it's abstract and symbolic. Um, so the letters, the words do not have any inherent meaning. So the word river is just sound. Yeah, we just associate that sound with a moving body of water. Interestingly, pronunciation is more important than the definition. That's why we have dictionaries, not definitionaries. It's the, the deception in this language is, is about pronunciation. Okay, I'll come into that a little later on. And it turns out that English is not primarily designed for communication. Okay, now I'm going to play a video by a guy called Noam Chomsky. And he's a linguist and uh, a philosopher. It's what he has to say about language. One general assumption about language, uh, almost a dogma in philosophy, um, uh, common understanding, uh, linguistics, uh, psychology, is that language is primarily a means of communication and that it evolved as a means of communication. Uh, probably that's totally false. Uh, it seems that language is uh, evolved and is designed as a mode of uh, creating and uh, interpreting thought. It's a system of thought, basically. It can be used to communicate. Uh, everything people do can be used to communicate. You can you communicate by your hairstyle, you know, style of walk, everything. And yes, language can be used to communicate, but it doesn't seem to be part of its design. Its design seems to be radically different. And in fact, even seems to undermine communication. If you look at carefully at the structure of language, you find case after case right at the core of language design where there are conflicts between uh, what would be efficient for communication and what is efficient for the specific biological design of language. And in every case that's known, the communicative efficiency is sacrificed. It, it just isn't a consideration. And I think that's, uh, that's, a con that's a conclusion that has very widespread significance. So that was very interesting. He said that, uh, first of all, he said it was a manufactured language. And he actually corrected himself just to make the point that it's a manufactured language. And he said it's not for communication. It's for, it's for interpreting and creating thought. It's interesting. So, Carrying on with what is English, modern English was created around about 1500 as part of the Renaissance period. Yeah, a lot of things happened in that period. A lot of things that weren't good for us happened in that period. So English is actually relexified German. Now what I mean by relexification is if you, know, you wanted to kind of speak Spanish, you might say for the red house, you might say la rojas casa. But that's not Spanish. It uses Spanish words, but English grammar. Because in Spanish, it's la casa rojas, the house red. Yeah, that's Spanish. When you say la rojas casa, that's English. That's the English grammar using Spanish words. It's not Spanish. English is actually relexified German. It uses that Anglo-Saxon grammar with divergent German words and words borrowed from other languages. So, as I said before, English is a backwards language. 
Um, Paleo Hebrew came first, so um, it was, it's right to left. So English is actually a backwards language. And English is a language of deception. English is actually processed in the left hand side of the brain. And this is where education targets. In schools, they, they, they've all but got rid of anything that stimulates the right hand side of the brain. Yeah, anything creative, it's all about remembering numbers and remembering dates and, uh, and figures, facts and figures. Yeah? It's all left brained. They're trying to root us in the left half of our heads. So I was saying that English is a language of, of, uh, of deception. Well, you can tell what's important in a language um, by seeing you know, how, how many words they have for a certain thing. So the Inuit, you know, they, they have uh, 50 words for snow because snow in their world is, is pretty much the most important thing to know about. The nuances of snow can be life and death to them. You know, certain snow will hide ravines so you know they they will know if a certain uh, type of snow falls then there's danger yeah so they need to know the nuances of snow but we have one word for snow snow is not important to us interestingly though we have 112 words for deception in the english language so you can tell what's important in this language and uh, the deception here, this is, this is from an Anglo-Saxon dictionary. The word black actually means white. Um, it comes from two words in Anglo-Saxon, B-L-A-C and B-L-E-A-C. Yeah? And it means bright, shiny, um, pale, pallid, wan, bleach, bleak. Yeah? That's the, these English words, the, these two Anglo-Saxon words are the root for it. Um, to bleach, to whiten, um, uh, to turn pale, and leprosy. Cool. Yeah? So, and leprosy isn't this uh, skin wasting disease, it's literally when your skin turns white. That's what it was in the, in the Old Testament. Um, so, black means white. Yeah? <laughs> so, um, as I said, English is backward speech. So when we, when we lie, interestingly enough, you know, our, our subconscious always wants to tell the truth. So body language is literally our subconscious going, I'm lying, I'm lying, you know, <laughs> whenever we lie. Um, so our physiology wants to tell the truth too, because when we, when we lie, we can't help but sweat a little bit. And, uh, you know, our breathing quickens and, you know, our skin resistance changes. Yeah, that's where lie detectors can, can detect these things. But also, our speech will also tell the truth in reverse. I'm going to play this one. Now, yes, we can. Yes, we so can. somebody's taken yes, we can. the speech yes, we where can. he says, yes, we can four times. So what it's going to do is actually copy it and... Uh, and sort of copy it across, so there's two copies of that, uh, that speech. And then he's going to select the second copy. Okay, so he's just pasted the, the second copy there. He's going to select the second copy and reverse it. Just going to hit reverse. Now he's going to play it. Let's see if you can tell what Yes, we saying. can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Did you hear it? Thank you, Satan. He says that a lot. In, in, during the campaign trial, I said it a lot. And uh, some of them are really, really absolutely clear. And even there was a song that was out um, uh, that featured all these celebrities um, you know, singing along and saying, yes, we can. And, um, and yes, they were absolutely clear as well. The funny thing is, if you, know, you or I said it, it wouldn't come out as thank you, Satan. Yeah, you have to say it in a very specific way that you can't you know, actually make yourself say it so it will come out in reverse. Yeah? It's literally something inherent in us. It's no accident, as you can see from the, the picture of Obama there, there's no accidents when they, they take pictures or, or make things for TV. Can you see the horns? Yeah. yeah? 
it's not an it's not an accident. No. If they if they were setting this up for his TV appearance, they would have gone, oh look, that looks like he's got horns. Let's change the backdrop. No, it was deliberate. When I first come across this uh, reverse speech, it just so happened that I realised that I was on um, the mailing list of a guy called David Oates, and I'd been getting these emails from him for for years, and I. I kept ignoring them. I was like, uh, reverse speech, that sounds really, vaguely satanic. I don't want to really do anything with it. So I, I ignored them until I started um, researching language. I thought, let me have a listen to what he's got to say. And it was pretty amazing. 35 years ago, my life changed very dramatically. Uh, I was in the bathroom and listened to a Walkman, dancing to the music, when suddenly the Walkman fell out of my belt straight into the toilet bowl. <laughs> and I pulled the thing out, and it was useless. I talked it apart, tried to dry it out with the, with the hair dried, and then I put it back together again, and then only worked back, backwards. Oh, so I had this totally useless Walkman that only played backwards. For some reason, I kept it. I've no idea why. And uh, then when I was, um, I moved back to Australia, and a few months later, I was running a halfway house for street kids. I'm a youth worker by profession. That's my early career. And um, one of the kids uh, gave me a tape of an evangelist. And he was preaching the rock and roll of the devil's music. And if you take records and run them backwards, you can hear the voice of Satan. And I go, oh, yeah? That's, that's a bit weird. But I said, look, I've got a backwards playing Walkman at home. So let me go and put some of these tracks in and see what I can hear. So I got on my Walkman, I wired it up to my stereo, and uh, um, I'm going to play you a couple of reverse backward messages I found in music right back at the very beginning. This is before I moved on to speech. So well, this is Creedence Clearwater Revival. It was down in Louisiana, just about a mile from Texarkana. In their mold, cotton field back home. Okay, I'm running reverse. There's no, there's, uh, this is not a deliberate backward message. This is uh, done quite unintentionally. And so you can hear him singing, I believe in my cool woman. Wow. And that's straight backwards. Let me run the whole tape backwards for you and you'll hear it amongst the gibberish. You hear that amongst the gibberish there? Yeah. I believe in my cool woman. So, okay, so I go, hmm, well this is very interesting, what on earth is this? So then, uh, here's another one I found in music, this is back in my early days. He's worth a fancy fortune, but it's not in the space, I'm gonna find my claim. She's talking about finding her perfect man, and she sings backwards, he'll come out full of magic. <laughs> so I'm scratching my head. This is back in my, you know, my late twenties. I'm going, well, this is all very weird. What on earth is this? So um, I spent probably about three or four months running my whole musical collection backwards and uh, <laughs> most people thought I'd gone crazy. My parents were quite concerned about me actually. <laughs> Especially when I went and asked my mum for the hall for the hallelujah chorus. He said to me, you're not gonna play the hallelujah chorus backwards. So, here we have a modern one. This is Marley Cyrus in the song Wrecking Ball. We clawed, we chained our hearts in vain, we jumped, never asking why. Um, are you familiar with Miley Cyrus' oh, yeah. videos? Well, this reversal won't be a surprise. This girl, Horny, she loves you. This girl, Horny, she loves you. This girl, Horny, she loves you. Typical Miley Cyrus. <laughs> yeah. Then we started to find this stuff in normal human speech. We never thought it would exist in speech. Currently it was just music, you know. So um, I'm going to play a couple of examples in speech to start off with. This is, um, this is Angelina Jolie. I grew up kind of very, uh, very aware of my own emotions. I grew up very aware of my own emotions. Here, listen carefully. Tell me what she's saying back, backwards. I am very aware. I am very aware. What do you hear? I am very aware. I'm very aware. Very aware. Very aware. Very aware. Very, who, who heard very aware? I am very aware. Okay, let's do it again. Here we go. 
I'm very aware. Can you hear that? I'm very aware. So she says forwards, I grew up very aware. I grew up kind of very, uh, very aware of my own emotions. Let me run it backwards. Norman, I am very aware. Are you aware? You know that amongst the gibberish there? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Okay, let's play another simple example. This is uh, Newt Gingrich. It's an amazingly badly written bill. And backwards, he says this. A real bad meal. A real bad meal. You hear that? There? A real bad meal. A real bad bill. Let's run the whole lot backwards. I am a real bad meal. Is he a minister? So literally, if you take speech and run it backwards. About once every 15 or 20 seconds, you'll hear this very clear phrase amongst the gibberish. Um, we, uh, uh, we spent several months researching this, running tapes backwards, and by the time we had about one or 2,000 reversals, um, we felt confident enough to write a theory. And the theory that Greg and I came up with was that language is bi-level, forwards as well as backwards. As the human brain is constructing the sounds of speech, putting those sounds together in such a way that we're saying two things at once. One forward from the conscious mind, and the other one in reverse from the unconscious mind. This is a natural <coughs> function of language. There's nothing uh, occultic or satanic about it. It's a, it's a previously undiscovered human sense. And uh, let's, play a, let's play another uh, simple one from a politician. Here we have Hillary Clinton on the campaign trail, having a go at Donald Trump. And you know what? It also matters when he makes fun of people with disabilities. Calls women pigs. And here he, she says, and I'll scam you. And I'll scam you. <laughs> and I'll scam you. Yeah. And I'll scam you. Very clear. And let's run the whole lot backwards. Here we go. Scam them as you know how that occurs among the gibberish? I'm playing it backwards so you can see I'm not altering the tape here. This is straight forwards and straight backwards. So some of my critics say, well, I'm altering the tape to make the reversals appear there. Believe me, it would take far much more work to order the tapes to create a reversal. This is um, an in incongruent reversal. However, things start to change. Here he is talking about... Mexico paying for the wall. What's the difference? I want to get the wall started. I don't want to wait a year and a half until I make my deal with Mexico. So, and we probably will have a deal sooner than that. And by the way, Mexico has been so nice. Okay, so saying Mexico is going to have a deal soon. That was, he says, they will not deal with us. Uh -huh. uh, we will not deal with us. Uh, we are okay? yeah. So that's incongruent, it's contradictory. They will, he's saying for us, we'll make a deal with Mexico back as they will not deal with us. Are we going to get a deal from Mexico to pay for the wall? No way. Ain't going to happen. No way. Never going to no happen. This is, uh, this is uh, Patsy Ramsey, the mother of John Bonet Ramsey, the mm. beauty queen who was murdered mm -hmm. in Golden back in 1796. We feel like there are at least two people on the face of this earth that know who did this. And that is the killer and someone that that person may have confided in. So she says the killer and someone that that person, referring to the killer, may have confided in. Backwards, she tells us who that person or the killer is. Mm -hmm. Listen very carefully to what she's saying. One dead person. Whoa. One dead person. I'm, I'm that person. Who heard that? I'm that person. Yeah, absolutely. I got, a, I got reversals that explain the whole thing. I, I won't go into it. I don't have time, but I've done whole programs on that. Okay, so that's Patsy Ramsey. I'm that person. And here we have um, Scott Peterson. He's currently sitting in death row in California. He's, he uh, was suspected of murdering his wife to cover up an affair. Uh, Scott Peterson. Yeah. So here he is being interviewed. A reporter says, did you murder your wife? Did you murder your wife? No, no. I uh, did not. And backwards he says, neck, I hit hard. When they found her body, she was decapitated. Oh. So what he did was, <laughs> Net, I hit hard. 
So that's an example of, um, you know, when you tell, the, tell a lie forwards, you actually tell the truth backwards. It's what he calls an incongruent reversal. Okay. Now you can get the, uh, the opposite, which is a congruent reversal. And we'll have a listen to a couple of those. This is an Australian Aboriginal talking about how he found a whole extended family. And I was about 30, 35, and I found out that my father was alive. How did you find out? Um, it was just through word of mouth. Okay, listen carefully. This is a thick Aussie accent. See if you can hear this one. I am but all your sister. I am an older sister. I have an older sister. I have an older sister, exactly right. The skeptics will tell you, you're only hearing these because I'm telling you to hear them, but this is about the tenth reverse I've played so far where I've asked you to hear them and you're all here hearing them. When we do classes, we will run the tapes backwards in front of all the students and the student will hear the same reversal at the same time. You know, it's like, wow. So this is not all torto suggestion. These are phrases that actually exist. The brain can be seen responding to the reversals. So he says, I have an older sister, and look what he talks about next. Said to you, something was said to you, was it? Yeah, I just talked to different ones about it because I was sort of trying to trace a sister, one of his sisters. So you found out that you had sisters and brothers? Yeah, I, was, I knew all along I, I had one sister. So what's the odds of that, saying I have an older sister backwards, and then saying forwards, I've got a sister? Okay. We will just digress momentarily. I'll play you a house fire. Uh, I, we, we, actually, we actually got that... Uh, example on tape, because uh, I was in the God. session work with a client and the tape recorder was going and uh, my secretary ran in and said, David, the house is on fire. Listen to this. And we'll run this one forwards. Yes? What? And uh, backwards she says the same thing. The house is on fire. Our house is on fire. That's backwards. Here it is. Here it is forwards. What? very interesting. Here's a woman who's got depression issues. I started doing something about my life, about the situations that I found myself in. And here she says, need more sunlight. Need more sunlight. <laughs> need more sunlight. So in order to fix her depression, we've got to give her sunlight. Okay. Okay. Exactly right. And so reverse sweet will come down and tell us. Um, okay, so uh, okay, here's another woman who's uh, got creating her own behavioural issues. Fear of doing it on my own, although there's another part of me that likes to do it on my own. And here she says, I am wanting you grief. I am wanting you grief. I am wanting you grief. Yeah. I am wanting you grief. So what's going to happen in her life in the next week or two? One interesting thing he said there was that the brain responds to reversals. So, so you literally, you know, subconsciously hear the reversal and respond to it. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very real phenomenon. I'm going to move on to um, this guy, um, Terence McKenna. Anybody know Terence McKenna? Yeah. yeah, very cool geezer. Yeah, um, he was an expert in uh, psychoactive drugs and stuff, and, um, and he had some words to say about language. For us, it's a substitute for other forms of cohesion like pheromones, which are a kind of language that knit together insect societies. We've created societies of billions of people, and the linkage is language, and it's, it's a, an unsteady linkage, as we can see. What we do, I think, that no other animal does, is we carry out symbolic activity, and it's this symbolic activity that has closed us off from the, the reality of what lies outside the symbol system. Do you that? Symbolic activity? Everything we do, I mean, for instance, think of a child lying in a crib with an open window and a hummingbird comes through the room. 
well, this is like a miracle. It's all light and iridescence and whirring sound. And the child is sucked into the presence of a miracle. And then its nurse or its mother comes into the room and says, it's a bird, baby, bird. Suddenly, the miracle is collapsed into a lexeme. And by the time you are five years old, the entirety of reality has been very carefully mosaicked over with words. And to burst through that to whatever reality lies beyond is the task of a, of a, of a mystic or a shaman. And it's extraordinarily difficult. That's what I mean by trading in the world for symbolic signification. What you notice um, when you experiment with these shamanic tools such as psychoactive plants is that as, as the intoxications deepen, thought becomes vision and one thinks in images. And I imagine that this is the aboriginal thought style. And we must have thought in images for a long time before we downloaded into words. Uh, to the degree that people think in images, I think they are a different sort of person than the word-oriented person. I think thinking in words may be an artifact of writing and print and may have been most intensified in the last thousand years. I mean, sensory ratios are incredibly subject to cultural modification. As an example of what I mean by that, St. Augustine, to prove his piety, they would open a book of scripture in front of him, and without making a sound, he would examine it for a few minutes, and then they would close the book and question him, and he was able to discuss what was written there on the page. He was the only man in Europe, in other words, who could read silently. And it was thought a miracle. Well, I, we all read silently and think nothing of it. So I think the mind is very malleable and the imprint of culture very deep. This is an area where we are very naive. How our languages affect our view of the world. This is typical Terence McKenna. He's, his, his language, his use of language is really sort of multi-layered and deep and you can listen to him a dozen times and find new things every time you listen to him. But um, some of the things he, he brought out there, have you ever wondered why, you know, when you're a child, everything is just wonderful. You've got this childlike wonder about everything. And he just, he just told you what, what happens. You collapse reality down to a word. Just think for a moment about the hummingbird. As a child, you see this, this beautiful thing, you know, iridescent colours, you know, just hovering in the air so, and, and making these really precise movements. And, you know, it's really beautiful and amazing, right? And then it gets turned into a word, bird. Bird does not capture the experience. The word does not capture the experience. Yeah, so um, what we've, we've done is we've put a... A, a linguistic layer between us and reality yeah so so that layer doesn't doesn't express the experience of reality it just turns it into word so now the the child thinks you know sees a hummingbird doesn't see the the, the wonder anymore just sees bird does that make sense yeah um, so we you know we think in words now um, and uh, the other interesting thing he said was that uh, when you have a, a trip on a psychoactive uh, substance, yeah, you do start thinking in, in, in images now. That's that. That's the, the experience. It's, it's you thinking in images and not in words anymore. And that's why it's so weird. You know, we're not used to thinking that way. You're reverting to your original language, your original default settings. And it's, you know, it's, it's some, for some people, it's too much. We're, we're so ingrained in this idea of thinking in words when those walls come down. And as I said, 
you know, language doesn't work the way we think it does. You know, it, it, can, it can switch on and switch off and, in all different languages, you know. And I think it's because of the, the subconscious knows all languages. So the point is, if, if you restrict the language, right, you restrict thought. If you think in, in, in words, if you restrict the language you, you're, you've got available to you, you literally restrict the amount of thought you can, you, you know, the limit of thought you've, you've got, okay? When you have a, a trip on a psychoactive uh, substance, it's literally dro um, dropping the barrier that language creates, the, the layer, uh, interpretive layer of language that literally separates us from reality. And when that's dropped, then we, we literally see reality for what it actually is. And that's where the childlike wonder comes back. You know, so why you have this, this almost euphoric experience on, on psychoactive drugs, because you, know, you just see, you see life as it really is. So here's an example of how um, our brain makes up reality. Right? There are um, 12 black dots on there, but your mind isn't going to let you see all of them, okay? Have a look. Can you see how many black dots you can, can you see? You can only see two, really. If you see more than two, what you're doing is you're letting your eyes flick slightly to one side and then you see a third one, but you lose one of the early ones. If you look uh, here, yeah, if you look here, you should be able to see the two at the top. See. Uh, oops, one there and one there. If you look here, right, or look here, yeah, you see those two. But you can't see that one down here. <laughs> yeah, because literally what, what's happening is you have a visual, uh, a tight visual acuity where you look at some, something and it's a very small circle. What your brain does, it paints in what it thinks is there. And because the pattern is so regular, it can paint in that pattern, and it paints over the dots. I was going to say, why would it paint in the dots? No, because it, it doesn't, the dots don't seem to follow the, the regular pattern. The pattern is very small, yeah? so it's very easy for the, the brain to paint in the rest. So it's not just these regular patterns, it's, it's, it's random patterns. Like if you look at that curtain, yeah? you look at it, and the bit that you're directly looking at right, is it, as it is, the rest of it over there is made up by your brain. Is that what they mean by hidden in plain sight? That's one of the things, yes. Your, your, your brain literally makes up reality just so you get a seamless experience. So English turns out to be a programming language for the human mind. I say English letters and, and words are symbols, yeah, like variables in a computer language. They're understood, the words are understood by pattern matching uh, in the left hand side of your brain, pattern matching, memory retrieval, um, and, and processing that all up here. Okay? Um, and it's taught by brainwashing. Yeah? Brainwashing is repetition, yeah? punishment, and reward. And that's what, that's what happens in school. <laughs> yeah? um, so, language, as I said, language represents reality. And so reality can be reprogrammed with words. And um, I'm going to give you a little example of this. This is a little bit of programming here. So what you're looking at, um, the top line of this, uh, this, this uh, made up code here, it tells you that uh, Y is a symbol that stands for 10. And X is a symbol that stands for 5. And result is 0. Okay. So if you go down to uh, line 8, it tells you that result equals x plus y. So you might be thinking, okay, when it says print result, 15. Yeah. Yeah? But what you might have not have noticed is that somewhere in the, in, buried in the code, x has been redefined to 0. Yeah? So now you think result is going to be 15, but it's actually 10. It's been redefined. You, you didn't know. And you're going through your life thinking, uh, you know, X is five, but it's zero. Does that make sense? So, this is what's happened with, with English. Okay. Um, legalese. 
we, we think we understand these words, register, person, identify, understand, notice, summons, must. They seem to make sense, you know, to us. We know what, we think we know what they mean. But they've literally been redefined in a, in a legal context. So when you register something, it means you hand over title ownership to whoever you're registering with. So in the case of your car, when you register your car, you literally hand over the ownership of it to the DVLA. And they go, hey, you keep it for us. <laughs> so they give it back to you and they say, you keep it for us. So you become the registered keeper. Yeah? But they own it because you've handed it to them. You do the same with your child. Yeah, when you register your child, you know, with a birth certificate, you literally hand that child over to the state. And they give that child back to you and say, here, you pair can rent them. You become the parents. Parents. The other thing they do when, when you sign that birth or sort of fill in that birth certificate is that the state turns that, uh, that, that child's name into a corporation. It's the person. Yeah, we, think, we, think, or we know what the word person means, you know, a human. Yeah, but no, it's, it means corporation. And that corporation is, is how the government interacts with you. So if you look at your bills, you'll find that that person is being re um, referred to. It's a name in all capital letters, which is spelled differently. It's a different word, because we don't know grammar anymore. Yeah? Um, we think that if it's all in all capitals, it means the same as you know, mixed case. Yeah? No, they're two different, two different words. So you look at all your bills, they're all in capitals, or they have a title, Mr, Mrs, Miss. Yeah? That also indicates that it's not you. But um, the thing is, if you assume the identity, and this is where we get to identify here, right? if you assume the identity of this corporation, now the government or, or, or these corporations can do whatever they want with that corporation with you attached to it. It's like an overcoat. Yeah? They can do whatever they want with the overcoat, but as, as soon as you put that overcoat on, now they can grab it and throw it in jail with you in it. So the word identify actually means make the same as. So when you when you're on you know get stopped um, on the road by the police and they say you know give me your license uh, your uh, identity you're saying I am a driver another fictional character you're making yourself the same as just like taxpayer is a fictional entity if you say I am a taxpayer well now you're liable to pay tax because you've now confessed to being a, a taxpayer does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, when they try and get your identity, they're trying to make you the same as a fictional character. And as soon as you say, yes, that's me, now you've um, confessed or consented to be that fictional character. Now they can do whatever they want with it. Same with understand. The word understand means to stand under, to accept you know, responsibility for, to agree to be bound by, to consent. So they're basically, uh, the police are asking you, do you consent to this statute as law? You say, yes, I understand. And now you've just said, I've consented. Do what you want. Yeah? Um, same with notice. You get a notice through the door and you think it's, uh, it's something that tells you it's a, like a demand. But it's not. It's an offer to contract. It's literally an offer. Here, look at this. Do you want to contract with me? That's what it is but we, we mistake it because we think it's something else. Um, you know, a summons is an invitation. It's not, it's not you know, um, legally binding or anything. It's, an, it's just invitation. You can if you want, if you, or not if you don't. And the, the word must has been redefined to mean may. So when it says on a document, you must do this, it really means you may do this. So you can see how... You know, X has been redefined, and now you read it and you see, you see it differently. Yeah? Yes? 
<laughs> so this is what's known as word magic. Word magic is, is literally manipulating that layer, that interpretive layer of language. So literally you change your reality by, re by manipulating that layer that interprets reality. Words, well, uh, you've probably heard this before, but words, the word words, if you switch the yes around, becomes sword. The pen is mightier than the sword. You can kill a couple of people with a sword, but with, with a few choice words, you could destroy an entire nation. The pen is mightier than the sword. And, you know, there are words in, in the language like uh, spelling. We spell words. What is that? It's magic. We, we use cursive. Curses. They're curses. You know, um, we've got uh, the word grammar. It actually is the same word as grimoire, which is a magical spell book. So, word magic is literally changing that interpretive layer. And uh, we, we see it with hypnotists. Yeah? A hypnotist can say a few words and make you believe that an onion is an apple. So, with a few words, he's changing that interpretive layer of getting the signals from when you smell an onion, um, taste an onion, you know, feel the crunch of an onion that's different from an apple. Right? But that interpretive layer has changed with those few words. Now you see reality as that being an apple. That's how powerful these, these words are. And we have the biggest hypnotist in the world in most of our front rooms. Yeah, the TV actually provides you with um, surrogate reality. And, you know, you watch something and you watch an experience on TV that you've not experienced yourself and it becomes part of your experience. And what happens if you're not aware of it, you literally replay what you've seen on television when you come to that kind of experience. And has, have you ever done something and gone, well, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Point, you know, point is, you've probably seen something like that on television, and literally you, your subconscious has gone, ah, this is a similar situation, and you've just replayed something that you've, you've seen. So I'm going to show you how, um, you know, how, how this kind of works, this word magic works. There are two circles on the... Oops, sorry, I haven't done that yet. Two circles on the screen, they're different. These are different. So I want you to look carefully and tell me which one is the biggest. You have to look very carefully. Right, take a few seconds to take a look. So how many of you think the red one is bigger? Show of hands. Uh, okay. How many think is the blue one's bigger? Okay. Anybody want to change their mind? They're different. They're different, so, so sorry, you, you, you said the same size, so look again, they're different, so which, which one's bigger? I think the blue one's bigger than the red one, I thought the red before. Okay. <laughs> Come on. So, so you, you think it's the blue one's now, you said that you thought they were the same size, but now you think the blue one? Well, they actually are the same size. But what I've done there, okay, I changed you with, with I, all I said was they're different. Yeah, yes, they are different. One's blue and one's red. As soon as you said it, I use words to fool you into believing that one was bigger than the other. Yeah? And you actually said it's the same size. Yeah? And with a few words, again, not telling lies or anything, I made you change your view to make the, one of them bigger than the other. See how powerful words are. Here's another one. Um, I I'm, I'm, don't want to do this. I don't, I'm not supposed to do this visually, but I'm, um, I'm going to skip through it. But uh, I want you to tell me, right? just say it out, out loud, um, what, how to pronounce the, the, the words that spelled Y-E-S. Yes. Yeah, everyone got that? Yes? yes. Right, so, yeah. Y-E-S. So... I want you to tell me how to pronounce the word E-Y-E-S. 
Come on, quick. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> It didn't work. Most of, most of the time, it's because I, normally you've got to, got to do it via um, audio. You know, I, I tell you the word, yeah, the, and you said it, E-S, yeah. Normally I get people and uh, I, they, they stand and go, E-S, no, that's wrong. Air, yes. And, and, but, but it's eyes, okay? Now, what, what should have happened <laughs> is that uh, when I, I said uh, I said the, uh, the the letters, you know, with with uh, my voice, right? What would happen was the auditory part of your brain listened to the the letters and then linked to the part of the brain that puts words to you know constructs words, yeah. And normally you stay in that mode when I add the e, and then you try e s or a s, and you try to construct the word from an audio perspective. Yeah? But when I show you the word, you go into visual mode and you look at the word as a whole and go, oh, that's eyes. And so it, it didn't work this time, but uh, it's worked a few other times. <laughs> but, but I get people sitting there going, no, it's yes or a, a yes. Oh. And yeah, I show them eyes and it's like, oh, bloody hell, of course. Um, so that's a shame. But so we have this um, phrase... Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That's absolutely not true. Here's an example of how, how we're getting hurt by words all the time. The word doctor, we think of it as a helper, um, you know, learned friend, teacher. But what do you do when you doctor food? You poison it. When you doctor a document, you falsify it. Yeah? This is, this is who we, you know, we're dealing with. We're dealing with lying poisoners. Yeah. And so other words like, um, like cure, it, literally the original meaning is to preserve, like cure meat. Mm. So when you say, I want to cure cancer, you're saying, I want to preserve it. Mm. When you say, I'm suffering with something, the original word for suffer is to permit, you know, never suffer a witch to live. Yeah? So you're saying, I'm suffering with cancer. I'm allowing cancer. Yeah? You're, you're literally programming yourself. Pharmaceutical, the word pharmaceutical comes from a Greek word called pharmakia. It means to poison and sorcery. It's in the words. Yeah? Words have power. You've seen so far that words have power in this world. And you're using these words against yourself. So, yeah, word, just ordinary words like nice means stupid and ignorant. And yeah, look it up, yeah? It actually means stupid and ignorant when you say, oh, yeah, oh that's nice, or you're nice, you know? <laughs> you're actually telling them they're stupid and ignorant. Um, try, the word try, it banish the word try from your, from your vocabulary because, you know, when you try, it means you, you'll never get there. You're always going to be trying, attempting, okay? Um, the word let, let me do this. The word let means to hinder, to obstruct. Yeah. Um, the word bad, this was an interesting one, means womanish and effeminate. So when Michael Jackson, before Michael Jackson had the bad album, he was still quite manly, wasn't he? You know, beat it, you know. But after bad, he was womanish and effeminate. Because he kept saying, I'm bad, I'm bad, you know. And in, and you also have got to look for word reversals. Um, the word love, reversed, is evil. And, you know, don't th say, oh, well, it's spelt differently. Yeah, well, nobody says evil, apart from um, Vincent Price. Yeah? <laughs> and nobody says ev evil. Evil. Yeah? So we're, we're, we're using this language, and it's, you know, the words in it are are literally ambiguous and they usually mean the opposite of what you think they mean. So even the word to know, yeah, has the word no in it, N-O. When you say, I know something, you're literally saying, I don't know something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as I said, um, thought, thought is energy. Thought is energy, right? And our voice is vibration. 
you put energy and vibration together, you get matter, you get manifestation. So I'm going to talk about Paleo Hebrew as a, as a contrast. Paleo Hebrew. Um, the word next to it is the word for Paleo Hebrew in, in Paleo Hebrew. It's uh, Lashawan Kadash. Okay, it means the holy tongue. So it's, this, is, it, this is the, um, the equivalent of Paleo Hebrew, the holy tongue. It's not, it's not a direct translation. You can't translate these, this language directly into English because it's apples and oranges. Yeah? Um, it's a language of pictures and it, it works through the subconscious and the heart rather than the left-hand side of the brain. Every letter in that language has eight different meanings. I've mentioned that before. Um, and the, the words that these letters make is a story those letters tell. So it's not like our symbolic language where they just don't mean anything. It's literally a story that not only um, gives it a label, but describes the entire experience of the word. And said it's a concrete language that can't mean anything but what it means. And it's not um, understood by a linear process, and it's, it's reflective of the Hebrew mindset, which was always about action, not about thought. This conceptual idea is Greek philosophy, which is why the New Testament is very different from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is about action, doing or not doing. The New Testament is about believing and thinking. So Paleo Hebrew is, is a right-brained activity. Now, which, which one are you in this? Now, there's two modes of thought. Um, when you're trying to describe you know, directions to somebody, are you the type of person who's um, cerebral and, uh, okay, if you, go, if you go west on Vine Street and take the second right on and you know you describe it like you're you're a GPS, yeah. <laughs> or are you, if you go to the church over there and turn right at the McDonald's, yeah, and there's there you will see this big um, elephant statue, and if you go, yeah, yeah, and you you can't talk without waving your arms about as well. That's that's the right hand side of your brain taking over. So um, I'm not sure I'll play the whole of this because I'm, I might be running out of time, but. Uh, this is a video of a woman who's a brain scientist who she was able to um, observe herself having a stroke. But on the morning of December 10, 1996, I woke up to discover that I had a brain disorder of my own. A blood vessel exploded in the left half of my brain. And in the course of four hours, I watched my brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process all information. If you've ever seen a human brain, it's obvious that the two hemispheres are completely separate from one another. And I have brought for you a real human brain. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So this is a real human brain. This is the front of the brain, the back of the brain with the spinal cord hanging down. And this is how it would be positioned inside of my head. And when you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from one another. For those of you who understand computers, our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. The two hemispheres do communicate with one another through the corpus callosum, which is made up of some 300 million axonal fibers. But other than that, the two hemispheres are completely separate. Because they process information differently, each of our hemisphere think about different things, they care about different things, and dare I say, they have very different personalities. Excuse me. Thank you. It's been a joy. <laughs> Our right human hemisphere is all about this present moment. It's all about right here, right now. Our right hemisphere, it thinks in pictures, and it learns kinesthetically through the movement of our bodies. 
Information in the form of energy streams in simultaneously through all of our sensory systems, and then it explodes into this enormous collage of what this present moment looks like, what this pro present moment smells like and tastes like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I am an energy being connected to the energy all around me through the consciousness of my right hemisphere. My left hemisphere, our left hemisphere, is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past, and it's all about the future. Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous collage of the present moment and start picking out details, details, and more details about those details. It then categorizes and organizes all that information, associates it with everything in the past we've ever learned, and projects into the future all of our possibilities. And our left hemisphere thinks in language. It's that ongoing brain chatter that connects me and my internal world to my external world. It's that little voice that says to me, hey, you got to remember to pick up bananas on your way home. I need them in the morning. It's that calculating intelligence that knows, that reminds me when I have to do my laundry. But perhaps most important, it's that little voice that says to me, I am. I am. And this is a portion of my brain that I lost on the morning of my stroke. On the morning of the stroke, I woke up to a pounding pain behind my left eye. And it was very unusual for me to ever experience any kind of, of pain. So I thought, OK, I'll just start my normal routine. So I got up and I jumped onto my cardio glider, which is a full body, full exercise machine. And I'm jamming away on this thing. And I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping onto the bar. And I thought, that's very peculiar. And I looked down at my body, and I thought, whoa, I am a weird looking thing. <laughs> and it was as though my consciousness had shifted away from my normal perception of reality, where I'm the person on the machine having the experience, to some esoteric space where I'm witnessing myself having this experience. And it was all very peculiar, and my headache was just getting worse. So I get off the machine, and I'm standing in my bathroom, getting ready to step into the shower. And I could actually hear the dialogue inside of my body. I heard a little voice saying, OK, you muscles, you got to contract. And you muscles, you relax. And, and then I lost my balance, and I'm propped up against the, the wall. And I look down at my arm, and I realize that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I end, because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was this energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what is wrong with me? What is going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter, went totally silent. Just like someone took a remote control and pushed the mute button, total silence. And at first, I was shocked to find myself inside of a silent mind. But then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of the energy around me. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. And then all of a sudden, my left hemisphere comes back online, and it says to me, hey, we got a problem. We got a problem. We got to get some help. And I'm going, oh, I got a problem. I got a problem. So it's like, OK, OK, I got a problem. But then I immediately drifted right back out into the consciousness. But it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you to the external world. So here I am in this space, and my job and any stress related to my, my job, it was gone. It was beautiful there. And then again, my left hemisphere comes online, and it says, hey, you've got to pay attention. We've got to get help. And I'm thinking, I've got to get help. I've got to focus. So I get out of the shower, and I mechanically dress. And I'm walking around my apartment. And I'm thinking, I've got to get to work. I've got to get to work. Can I drive? Can I drive? And in that moment, my right arm went totally paralyzed by my side. 
that I realize, oh my gosh, I'm having a stroke. I'm having a stroke. And then the next thing my brain says to me is, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> this is so cool. How many brain scientists have the opportunity to study their own brain from the inside out? <laughs> and then it crosses my mind, but I'm a very busy woman. <laughs> A stroke. It's like, okay, I can't stop the stroke from happening, so I'll do this for a week or two, and then I'll get back to my routine. Okay, so I got to call help. I got to call work. I couldn't remember the number at work. So I remembered in my office, I had a business card with my number on it. So I go into my business room, and I pull out a three inch stack of business cards, and I'm looking at the card on top. And even though I could see clearly in my mind's eye, what my business card looked like, I couldn't tell if this was my card or not, because all I could see were pixels. And the pixels of the words blended with the pixels of the background and the pixels of the symbols, and I just couldn't tell. And then I would wait for what I call a wave of clarity. And in that moment, I would be able to reattach to normal reality. And I could tell, that's not the card, that's not the card, that's not the card. It took me 45 minutes to get one inch down inside of that stack of cards. In the meantime, for 45 minutes, the hemorrhage is getting bigger in my left hemisphere. I do not understand numbers. I do not understand the telephone, but it's the only plan I have. So I take the phone pad and I put it right here. I take the business card, I put it right here, and I'm matching the shape of the squiggles on the card to the shape of the squiggles on the phone pad. But then I would drift back out into La La Land and not remember if when I come back if I'd already dialed those numbers. Eventually, the whole number gets dialed, and I'm listening to the phone, and my colleague picks up the phone, and he says to me, roo, 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 roo. <laughs> <laughs> And I think to myself, oh my gosh, he sounds like a golden retriever. <laughs> and so I say to him, clear in my mind, I say to him, this is Jill, I need help. And what comes out of my voice is, roo, roo, roo. And I think, oh my gosh, I sound like a golden retriever. So I couldn't know, I didn't know that I couldn't speak or understand language until I tried. Stimulation coming in through my sensory systems felt like pure pain. Light burned my brain like wildfire, and sounds were so loud and chaotic that I could not pick a voice out from the background noise, and I just wanted to escape because I could not identify the position of my body in space, I felt enormous and expansive, like a genie just liberated from her bottle. And I remember thinking there's no way I would ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. So who are we? We are the life force power of the universe with manual dexterity and two cognitive minds. And we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. Right here, right now, I can step into the consciousness of my right hemisphere where we are. I am the life force power of the universe. I am the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses that make up my form at one with all that is. Or I can choose to step into the consciousness of my left hemisphere where I become a single individual, a solid, separate from the flow, separate from you. I am Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, intellectual, neuroanatomist. These are the we inside of me. Which would you choose? Which do you choose? So you, do you recognize some of what we've been uh, speaking of so far in, in what she's saying? So um, I want to show you um, a bit about um, how Paleo-Hebrew works compared to how English works. Okay? So we're going to do a little experiment. Um, I'm going to uh, describe a film in English, and you can see it written there, and I want you to guess what the film is. Okay? So a man on the autistic spectrum recounts his life, the events of his life, to strangers. What's the film? Yeah. Forrest Gump, anyone else? Brain Man, anything else? Okay, Forrest Gump and Rain Man. Okay, so as I said, 
uh, Paleo Hebrew is a language of pictures. So I'm going to use emoticons. Okay? So the emoticons are man running, a few trees, a box of chocolates, a shrimp, and a boat. Right, so when I, when I started to, um, speaking about uh, describing it in English, okay, what happened was in the left hand side of your brain, you were listening to the words I was, I was saying, you went and fetched the meanings of those words and you started to connect them to films you've seen. Okay, and some of you said Forrest Gump and some of you said Rain Man. Could have been Beautiful Mind and a few others that other people have said. But when I started talking, to, um, describing the pictures, you know, in Paleo Hebrew, right, what happened was you heard the description and, and imaged the, the picture in your mind, and at, all at once, it was like, oh, that's Forrest Gump, obviously. Yeah? Is that, am I, am I right? Yeah? I, literally, it didn't happen, that processing didn't happen in your brain, in the left-hand side of your brain. It literally welled up. It was like obvious. You knew what it was. Okay? That's the difference between English and Paleo Hebrew. Okay? I didn't have to spell those. Yeah? yeah I could put them in any order. Yeah? And, you, and that set of pictures can only mean Forrest Gump. Yeah? Now, so that, could, that can only mean Forrest Gump because that set of pictures gives you the experience of the film. You know, I gave you some words, and that didn't give you the experience. It gave you uh, a linguistic concept of the film. Okay, so have a look at this for a little while and see if you can guess any of the films. Just shout them out if you know them. Men in Black. Men in Black. That's a good one. E.T. E.T. Go on. That's an easy one. Right, easy one. Right near the bottom. No, no. Life of Pi. Lord of the Rings, yeah. the one in the middle is a bit difficult. Benjamin Button, okay. Can you see when you first looked at that, that set of pictures, you were like, "What the, what the?" And then all of a sudden, they started to come, didn't they? Yeah, because you're having to train your brain away from thinking in words, and you were started thinking in pictures. Because what happened was on Facebook, somebody sent um, posted a meme with like thirty of these, you know. Um, films in pictures and I looked at it for the first time and went what the hell am I looking at I want the and then I saw one of them it was like oh that's Life of Pi and then, uh, oh and that's and, and it all started because it all started to come because I trained my brain back to the way it normally well, you know the default settings um, so uh, English is very ambiguous and it can mean whatever those who control the language want it to mean um, as I said, the, the, these Paleo Hebrew, the pictures didn't need to be spelled and they can only mean one thing because it's a concrete language. This is the language that the Old Testament was written in. Yeah? This, is, this is why it's so, so difficult to translate it because you can't translate from something concrete to something abstract without losing a lot. So this is, this is Paleo Hebrew, and um, I'm just going to show you, uh, give you a few examples. Yeah, the first one at the top there is the word for father, Abba. Okay? Um, and it's, uh, the letter A is the head of an ox, and it means strength, power, leadership, guidance, you know, first. Okay? And uh, the letter B is floor plan of a tent. It means ho house, home, family, bloodline. Yeah? So, father is strength, leadership, guidance of the family. It's not just a label, it's a description, it's an experience. Um, mother, ama, yeah, it's strong water. M, the M there, it means water, or blood, or, yeah, a few other things. Water, blood, I can't think, liquid, sea, whatever, yeah. But... That's the word for glue in Paleo Hebrew. Yeah? It's the glue that binds the family together. So you've got the strong leadership, guidance from the father, and the glue that binds the family together. Brother is ach. Okay? The, the second letter there is the is ch sound. Okay? It's, it means fence. 
barrier, protector. Your brother is a strong protector. Okay? And can you see how easy this is? It's, it's, it's describing the experience. Um, here's one, walk. Okay? So what do you do when you, uh, if you're an ancient Hebrew and you, uh, you want to go for a walk? You take your staff, which is the lamed, the la, the letter L, which is, you know, the shepherd's staff. And the K, the kaf, or ka, is, um, is the palm of the hand. So you take your staff in the palm of your hand and you go for a walk. That's why our word walk is spelled W-A-L-K. You know, have you wondered why it's walk? <laughs> yeah, it's literally from the Paleo Hebrew. Um, the last one is a good example of uh, how, how difficult it is to translate. Right? This um, af, yeah, a and the, and the p sound, okay, is, um, is literally angry. Or nose is the word for nose in Paleo Hebrew, yeah? You know, so a is strong, powerful, okay, and the p is, is the mouth. It's a picture of a mouth, essentially. So um, it's essentially saying strong breath. So why is it angry? So what happens when you get angry? Yeah? Strong, it's, it's again, a language that's describing experience. And if you, um, I'm not going to go too far into it, but if you look at the whole list of meanings of uh, both these words, you can, you can feel the experience of anger. Yeah? But the word actually means nose. You know, when you translate it in relaxified Hebrew, yeah, it means nose. So the line in the Bible that says, uh, you know, the Most High is quick or slow to anger, it would come out as slow to nose. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't seem to make sense, but this is why this, I'm tr trying to get across how difficult it is to translate one from the other. Um, so anger in English is an abstract concept. You can't look at anger, you can't see anger. You know, it's this abstract concept. But af is a real experience. Again, this is a difficulty translating the Bible. It seems, it only seems like it's metaphorical and allegorical, yeah? It's just the way when you translate from one to the other. Can you see that? It's how, you know, translating that real experience into, into the symbolic language, yeah? It's a bit sort of, makes it sound all sort of metaphorical. Um, but every letter, right, is a word picture. Every letter. A is a, is a head of an ox and it's a picture. You put um, those letters into words, it's another word picture. You put those words into a story, the whole story is a word picture. That's how you read the Old Testament. It's, it's word pictures. Modern Hebrew isn't Hebrew. So this is, this is the modern Hebrew. Um, it's actually Yiddish, with, um, uh, which is a dialect of German, with Aramaic or Babylonian block characters. It's, it's literally there for deception. It was, it was only invented, you know, uh, just over 100 years ago. Um, and it's designed to hide the meaning of the words in the Old Testament. Um, and here's an example of that. In the, uh, in the Old Testament, there isn't the word devil. There is no word devil in the Old Testament. There's the word devils. So when you, went, when you go to uh, check it out, find out um, what, what devils means, well, it's the word saia, S-A apostrophe I-Y-R, okay? It means shaggy, um, he goat, uh, half man, half goat, um, uh, satia, yeah. Um, now, if you look, you know, if you just look at that, you might think, okay, that's, I've got an idea what a, what a devil is. But there's another word in the, in the fake Hebrew called seer, S-E apostrophe I-Y-R. But when you look at uh, Paleo Hebrew, there's no E. As I said, there's no vowels apart from the, an assumed ah uh sound after every letter. So where it says, where you see the E, it's an A. So it's the same word. So you can take the meanings from seer and add it to sair, and it's, it gives you an expanded meaning. 
And it actually turns out to be Sierra's mountain that uh, Esau and his children went to live in. And um, if you know that story of the Bible. But um, you add those meanings and you find it's a people they're talking, you know, who are the devils. Now, that, these two words have a root word in there, I-Y-R. And you look that up and it means watcher class angel which is the, type, the, the, the same class that came down and had sex with women who became the fallen angels. So it's telling you, it's telling you a story. It's telling you a story of a people who mixed with the fallen, fallen angels and went to live in a certain place. So they are the devils. And you wouldn't find that if you just looked at the, the regular Hebrew. So the Old Testament is literally a Hebrew document that the Western mind, which is the backwards symbolic mind, can't fully comprehend. Um, so are we really born not being able to communicate with our parents? Does that make sense? You know? Turns out that animals speak a language of pictures. Now, scientists basically put somebody in a, a tank with a, with a dolphin and a dolphin went up to and started gibbering at this person. And they took that sound and recorded it and put it through one of those cymoscopes that we saw in the beginning. And it actually drew the picture of that man. And they took that sound and played it to another dolphin who wasn't uh, originally in that same tank. And that dolphin was able to pick out that particular man out of... So, so literally, they, they speak in a language of, of pictures. Uh, with sound. Yeah. Have you seen this? <laughs> this is a real conversation. Can you see this as a real conversation? Yeah, no, no, you're wrong. Actually, there's a good video of somebody uh, overdubbing this with a couple of American accents. It's really funny, actually. But you get the picture. They're, they're communicating. This is a real conversation. Um, my daughter has... Uh, let's stop this. Hold on. Yeah, so my daughter, at two years old, when we were in um, Jamaica, um, she got playing with a, a two-year-old girl who was German. And they, my daughter doesn't speak German, she didn't speak English. Um, and they played for three days, non-stop, um, doing complex things. They couldn't speak to each other, but they, they were playing as if they, they, they were communicating. And they were. Right? And obviously we lose that. So babies, it turns out, speak Paleo-Hebrew. Yeah? Paleo-Hebrew, as I said, is a language with no vowels, just an assumed ah sound after every le letter. So the letters are a ba ga ra pa la What does that sound like? Yeah. Baby language. Yeah? So all babies know two words. They don't have to be taught. Two most important words for a baby to know. What are they? So, Paleo-Hebrew, as I told you, for, for father, is Abba. Every language has a derivation of Abba, Papa. In Turkey, which is very close, is, is Baba, yeah? Dada, yeah? So, um, for mother, Amma. These babies don't need to be taught these words. So, yeah, we, we literally educate our, our babies out of the language. Imagine the baby's born and says, you know, hey, mum, I'm here. And the mother's going, oh, that's nice, she's, she's trying to talk. Oh. And it's like, oh, she doesn't speak the language. I'm going to have to learn her language. And that's how it works. Listen to this voice. Listen to the structure. Now, just remember the structure, the sound, the, the feeling of what she was saying. She was clearly excited. Listen to this. Yeah. 
Now, did you notice the structure was the same? Even almost the words were the same. If you listened carefully to the little, little girl, she said, Amma, twice. She's talking to her father, and she said, Mother, twice. Yeah? Um, Arabic is very close to Paleo Hebrew, because obviously the location. And you can almost hear, they were almost the same. So, um, in the 1500s, 15th century, sorry, um, there was a king, a Scottish king, um, James IV, I think, um, who basically marooned a deaf woman, deaf and dumb woman, on an island, Inchkeith, um, with two newborn babies, and left them there for years. Right? Kept them, you know, gave, gave them food and stuff, but left them alone for years. Um, they came back, you know, um, after these children had grown up, and wondered if these two, two boys, who were brought up in silence, could speak a language. Now, um, the actual results were, were lost, but everybody who lived around that area say, and this is back in the 1500s or the 15th century, they say that these boys could speak perfect Hebrew. So, you know, circumstantial evidence, but uh, quite compelling. Today, you're going to meet a woman who claims that she was born with a special skill and has unlocked what she calls the secret language. I've always thought this was true. The secret language of babies. They have a language of their own. When Priscilla Dunstan was just a toddler, her parents discovered she had a special gift. From about the age of four or five, my mother used to play a Mozart concerto on the piano and I would play it back note for note, having heard it only once. Everybody realized at a young age that I had a photographic memory for sound. Priscilla says she was able to hear things others could not. I found that quite confusing as a child and even as a teenager. At school my photographic memory helped me because it meant that I could remember everything that the teacher said without having to take notes. Her remarkable ability even helps Priscilla detect people's moods. She says she can diagnose an illness all based on what she hears. When I hear somebody's voice I'm picking up colour and texture and vibrational rate and I'm listening out for pulse. There's the English that they're speaking, and then there's this whole other language underneath. The mysterious second language took on an astounding new meaning when Priscilla became a mother to her baby Tom. Because of my gift for sound, I was able to pick out certain patterns in his cries and then remember what those patterns were later on when he cried again. At this stage, I thought that the meanings that I'd written down was just a little language between Tom and I. Then I went out shopping and I realized that other babies were saying the same words. I realized that there were five words that all babies say, regardless of race and culture. So then I started to realize that this may indeed be something a lot bigger. I think this is so exciting, don't you? Because Priscilla Dunstan says that she has tested her baby language theory on over 1,000 infants around the world, all races and colors, and you believe that babies are talking to us. Yes, I do. It first started with my son, mm -hmm. and I realized that um, you know, his cry, he was trying to communicate something with me. And then I realized that it was actually a reflex. And we all have reflexes. You know, if we mm -hmm. hit our head, you know, the doctor checks our reflexes mm -hmm. to make sure that we're OK. And when sound is added to these reflexes, you, know, you get a particular sound, which mm -hmm. we're calling a word. So babies all around the world have the same reflexes and they therefore make the same sound. So all babies around the world, regardless of what um, race or nationality they are, yeah. speak the same language. They do. They it's have, baby language. Yeah, they have the I've same always language. thought that. First, take us through those five sounds, which are? Okay, the first word is ne. Ne. And this is the word for hunger. Ne. Okay, so that's ne for hungry. I'm hungry. What's the next word? The next word is owl, and that's the word for sleeping. <laughs> Very good. Now, you've uncovered a word that you say means discomfort. What is that? Yes, this is the word he and you're listening for the H part of the sound. Because he and ne are very similar. They are. They both have the S sound, but you're listening, in, with ne, you're listening for the N part, and with he, you're listening for the he. <laughs> yes.
Yeah, that's yeah. so fascinating, isn't it? So, Nair means I'm hungry. Yep. Al, and Al means sleepy. So I'm sleepy. That's when you'll put your baby to sleep. And, and Hep means, and he means I'm, dis, I'm in comfort. Yeah, so I'm that's uncomfortable. when you'll check to see whether they're hot or cold or whether they're in an uncomfortable position. And this is when you'll change their diaper. Okay. So, what is the next easy. sound? Very easy. What's the next sound? <laughs> the next sound is air. And this is a lower sound. So, if you imagine that your stomach is tightened down here and you go, breathe, breathe in to your stomach and go, <laughs> Oh, I know what that means. <laughs> Know what that is. That means. <laughs> That's harder to distinguish, though. Yeah. yeah, it's got more of an R sound. Yeah. The next one is eh. So it's ne, eh, he, and eh. They're hard yeah, to distinguish. They are, but you're here, you're just listening for the E part of the sound, the eh. Part. Okay, so. let's hear. And that means I want to burp. Yes. Okay, let's hear. <laughs> That's, uh, I got that. That's got, I love this. I love this. <laughs> okay. You say these five words only apply to babies from yeah. zero to three months. Yes. Yeah. The... So, um, Priscilla Dunstan actually found that, uh, you know, independently, that babies speak a language. And um, from naught to three months, yeah, they speak this language where, you know, if they, if they make the sound na, that means they're hungry. And, uh, you know, there's like five words that uh, these babies all, no matter where they are on earth, they'll say the same sounds. And if you know what those sounds are, you know what the baby is talking about. So, naught to three months. So I'm going to replay this uh, by um, David Oates, you know, reverse speech. Um, I had a question in my mind. When does reverse speech occur? Uh, when does it begin? Are we born with it? Or is it a natural function? Um, do we learn as we go up? As uh, fate would have it, in July of 87, I became the father of twin girls. So from the moment they came home from the hospital, guess what I was doing? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. I was taping them. I had the tape recorder out. For the first four months of age, I found nothing in reverse. But at four months of age, I found the first clear reversal. Listen to this. I run it backwards, you'll hear this very clear hello. Four months of age. Well, this is my daughter in the bathtub. She's at 30 months of age, not talking yet, and she's trying to pick up a cup. She can't pick it up, so she reaches out to me for help. So here's the fluids. <coughs> the baby talking about because she says, David, help me. Did you hear that? Yes. Isn't that amazing? Let's do it again. It's got that nice, beautiful sing song melodic tone to it. It's almost like she's singing. You know? It's such a wonderful reversal. I absolutely love that one. Um, okay. Um, Oh, here we have an example of what we call a mirror image reversal. I played you a couple of them earlier. I'm very aware I'm the real bad Bill. Mm -hmm. Here we have another one. I'm, I'm not a child. Daddy. You had Skeddy. And what else did you have? And carrot, and carrots, and milk. And milk? Oh, uh, then you had a nap? Yep. Yeah. Were you a good ruster? Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah? Say, I love you, Mama. I love you, Mama. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hold on, say it again. I love you. Where he says, I love you, Mama. Say, I love you, Mama. I love you, Mama. Backwards, he says the same thing, with the dad saying, our mummy. I love you, Mama. Our mummy. I love you, Mama. I love you. Can you hear that? Same thing backwards, it is forwards. Here's the forwards. <laughs> Say, I love you, Mama. I love you, Mama. And backwards. I love you, Mama. Mama. Okay. 
Okay? Forwards and backwards, mirror image reversal. Say, I love you, Mama. I love you, Mama. And back. I love you, Mama. Mama. There we go. So, a classic uh, mirror image reversal. So, uh, children are speaking backwards before they do forwards. Mm -hmm. From as early as four months of age, they are pronouncing <coughs> simple single words in reverse. So, <coughs> the point three of my theory of reverse speech is that human language begins backward before it does forwards. <laughs> the human brain is, con the unconscious mind is developing before the conscious. Is anyone surprised about that? No. No. Not at all. So the unconscious is what speaks first, and it's speaking in reverse. So I've had some psychologists say me, oh, that can't possibly be true. Children don't have the capability to speak backwards at four months of age. And I say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you explain to me what they're doing then? So, here we have an eight-year-old girl. This is also one of my uh, right-hand man's favourite examples. This is, uh, this is an eight-year-old girl who's telling us about her subjects at school. And she's about to tell us a subject she's not good at, but she has a slip of the tongue. I'm, I'm quite a good girl, and I'm, I'm quite good at math and English, but I'm not, and I'm, I'm shy. You hear that little slip of the tongue? But I'm not. She's about to tell us something she's not good English, at. English, but I'm not, and I'm, I'm And then when she has that slip of the tongue, she says this backwards. I'm not telling I'm not telling. I'm not telling. <laughs> no way. She's going to tell us what subject she's not good at. He was saying that uh, from naught to four months, there was nothing. But if you listen to P Patricia Dunstan, she was basically saying from naught to four months, they're saying the Paleo Hebrew words. They're trying to get our attention, but we don't understand. And she's actually started to figure out those words. But by about four months, they're speaking English in reverse. They're learning English backwards because, as I said, that's the way uh, we default. We, we, re we read English left or read language right to left. So, you know, David, um, David Oates is finding out that they're learning English backwards first. Um, so I've got Teletubbies on the screen because it's interesting that the color, colors mean something. Yeah, colours are symbolic to us. Those shapes on the heads are symbolic, okay? And if you've ever seen Teletubbies, they speak in baby talk. So what if they're actually talking to the babies? Really, you know? Yeah, it's scary. It's scary, you know? <laughs> um, so the conclusion. Um, sound creates and organises reality and we have very sophisticated sound-making devices. Yeah, we have a natural language of pictures and elementary sounds that we know from birth. Modern language is not for communication, it's there to interpret and shape the reality and how we perceive it. Um, we've been provided, right, this manufactured language uh, with an abstract symbolic backwards language that dis disempowers us and, uh, and has no positive effect on reality. And our power to co-create is being used against us. And as I said, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have any answers for you. I'm hoping that I've thrown lots of information to you and uh, something for you, for you guys is going to click and you might come up with something and you can tell me about it. <laughs> but in the, in the Old Testament, um, at the end, of, uh, the end of days, basically, um, the Most High says that uh, for, for then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Most High and serve him with one consent. And I believe that's returns to Paleo-Hebrew. And perhaps it won't take a stroke or a blow on the head for us to remember our original language. That's it. Thank you.